I just took a step back and was thinking, okay, if I was in Allie's shoes, what do I think would help me understand or what, what it simply, what would help me understand? And as a black person, I have viewed this documentary called 13th and it's on Netflix. And it, when I watched the documentary, my whole ideal ideology about the government, about black people in America. I mean, I know my black history. I am a part of black history, but that documentary shifted everything that I thought about our judicial system, our police force. And to add, my dad is, was a police officer in a black neighborhood in Cleveland and he is white. So I had like all of these thoughts and emotions that I've been kind of going through these last couple of days, but just in this documentary per se, this is where all the anger is coming from. And I just wanted her to understand that this is systematic. This is on purpose. This is, this is years, you know, it, like years of in the making. This is Social Justice in Women's Hockey, a new series of critical conversations about the role of women's hockey in the fight against oppression. I am your host, Erica Lindsay Ayala. Tonight, we speak to a pair of Boston College alumna, Blake Bolden and Allie Thunstrom. At the professional level, Blake and Allie continue to play hockey in the Professional Women's Hockey Players Association and the National Women's Hockey League, respectively. Our conversation is broken into two parts, both of which are available now on YouTube. We thank you for joining us for Social Justice in Women's Hockey. We hope you can learn something from this conversation with Blake and Allie, and that you are challenged to join the fight against all forms of oppression. Okay, Erica Ayala here with Allie Thunstrom of the Minnesota Whitecaps. Um, Allie, very happy to have you be an integral part of this conversation and this new series that we're bringing to women's hockey fans. Um, as you know, obviously, uh, you and I had a conversation earlier with Blake Bolden, but we wanted to come back and just um, lay the foundation and set the scene a little bit. So Allie, um, I'm going to kick it off to you to first just give us a sense of, as we record this on June 1st, you know, what is happening in Minnesota? Um, and we'll start there in how that led us to our conversation with Blake. Yeah, totally. So, you know, as, as the world and the nation knows, um, on Memorial Day on Monday, last Monday, um, George Floyd was, was murdered in the streets of Minneapolis, which is just a short, you know, 10 miles from where I live. Um, that's where my dad grew up. Um, my grandma still lives there. My cousin still lives there. So it, it's definitely a city that is very much home to me. So, you know, I didn't hear a lot about it until Tuesday, and that's when the video came out, and I, I remember seeing it with my family and watching it, and just so much disgust and horror. I, I've never seen um, somebody die in person like that, and, you know, it, it wasn't in a movie. It was a murder literally on TV that happened just miles away, and I, did, I couldn't make sense of it. I was heartbroken. You know, I think we all were. And immediately, like I said, that's my dad's hometown. Him and I both reached out to the mayor of Minneapolis via letter. He sent a text. I sent an email, which kind of seems backward given the age gap. But, you know, we immediately reached out and said, you know, you have to do something. This is not our state. This is not what we represent. Like, that was unacceptable. And we urge you to do the right thing here. And so, you know, it kind of went from there and there was just a lot of emotions. And then as Wednesday came, that's when, you know, the fires started in, in Minneapolis and I had tons of friends down there and I have friends that live just a mere blocks away that, you know, were posting like debris in their front yard and just that's how close it was getting. And 
then as you know things turned to thursday it just it was a whirlwind there was so much going on and you know i've seen riots on tv and i've never experienced it in person and i had no idea you know what to think and what was going on and as thursday was going it was sometime in between i'm not sure they they posted the address of the former officer if we want to call him that um and it was just a mile and a half down the road from my house and as i looked at the address it, it turned out that it was just a mere block away from one of my very very close friends who her husband's actually out of town and they have three young children and um we are getting word that people were coming from out of state to burn the house down and burn the neighborhood down and you know there was just all this information coming on facebook and through group messages and it, it was very overwhelming and all of these things were happening and it was nobody knew what to do and at that point um i got a text from my friend that lives a block over saying that they had been advised to essentially grab what they could and evacuate because they had reason to believe that people were going to come start fires and there was nothing they could really do to protect that area um you know if it, if it did start to burn down the, the collateral damage would likely be their houses in the neighborhood as well and that was kind of the point where i just kind of lost it and i didn't understand i want protection for my family and friends and i want them to stay safe and all i could think about was them and you know my friend and her three kids having to pack up what they could and go seek you know shelter somewhere else and that's when i sent the tweet and you know it, it was just a really overwhelming situation and, and very much in neighborhoods of people that i love and care deeply about yeah ali um you know again i've expressed this um, offline but you know I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry for what you and your community are going through and i mean that that's not a great picture that you just painted for all of us and it's certainly not great what we're seeing um you know on the news and on social media um now for everyone that's going to watch the conversation that we have where we br bring in blake golden as well um you know i i want everyone to know that we wanted to first you know give a little bit of a better intro we, we like died <laughs> we did yeah so we got down to it number one um but number two is you know i want to make it clear that you know, we all entered this conversation not of trying to really explain what happened in the past um, as far as, you know, decisions that you made surrounding your tweet. If anything, we were reflecting on what you did after that and hopefully, um, you know, what people can glean from that as they too are trying to figure out what to say, um, you know, how to own their own feelings while also being thoughtful. Um, so Ali, just before we cut over to the interview, uh, you know, the round table that we had, I, you know, what are some things from our conversation that we're about to play that um, have really resonated with you since the three of us were on the call? A lot, honestly. Um, I think that the, the call we had was just so incredibly powerful. And, and I think that, you know, collectively our voices moving forward are exactly what our sport specifically needs, but what everybody can learn from, you know, I, I don't, I can't assume that I understand your experience and, you know, vice versa, but I think that's a major thing that, you know, so often we want to say the right thing and, and make the right statement and, do the right thing too and make those actions but the piece that we tend to be missing is i need to listen to you and listen to what you need and listen to what your experiences are and you know i think that is the piece that we tend to to miss and lose sight of is it's not about what i can do to make me feel better or to make me feel like i'm making a difference i need to be a better listener to to people like Blake, yourself, people of the Black community, people of the LGBTQ community, everyone that's different from me, I need to take time to listen to them and to understand their needs before I ever try to assume that I understand what's going on. Yeah, I think that was a takeaway for me as well. I mean, we sh we all shared and I learned a lot that, that I had never, you know, I had never made connections to certain things uh, that you and Blake were able to share. And, you know, Blake's not here with us now, but definitely stick taps to her. Um, Absolutely. 
did a really great job of um, being open, not, not only to you, but also just even to this conversation. It's not necessarily something that she had to do. Um, and then she was, she was pretty open about her, you know, her process, uh, not just in this moment and what's happening in San Diego where she's at, but also through her career. Mm -hmm. And I really thought that that was powerful. So this is going to be, you know, the first installment of what will be a series of conversations with um, people in women's hockey players and fans. And I've already got an official <laughs> women talk. So thank you, Allie. And, and of course, thank you to Blake. And we're going to cut over to that interview now. Thank you. Standing. But I see from the outside, like in that moment, I was asking for protection, the very same protection that George Floyd should have been getting on Monday night and that the community should always have. And so I did make that connection and it's just like, I, I get it. it. It has provided a lot of. Allie, I've known you for a very long time. And I was shocked when you called or, t or reached out to me because you, we don't talk on a daily basis. So I was like, huh, this is interesting. And, and to be clear, I didn't read your tweet, but I know who you are and I know that you're a good person. So even just to hear you say that you went from here and then came full circle, that's a big step of understanding and you reaching out and starting a conversation and then being brave enough to talk about it further, you know? Mm -hmm. So you yeah. should be proud of yourself. I'm proud of you and I love you. I don't, I, I, I wasn't in your situation. I don't live in Minnesota. I don't see what's happening. And you were the first city, you know? Like now all these things are trickling down. Mm -hmm. San Diego yesterday was turned, you know? all these cities are, are burning, basically. And you didn't have time to process or understand because it was just right at your front step, like, boom. Mm -hmm. And you felt in danger or mm -hmm. upset about your friends too. So you're brave for doing your research and coming on here and talking about it and being empath, like just having the empathy and try trying to understand. So I'm, I'm proud of you for that. Thank you, B. Love you, always. <laughs> well, and, and thank you both. Um, you know, I think just to rewind a little bit, so obviously we've seen what has happened since George Floyd was essentially killed. Um, there were uh, different video uh, camera shots, and we saw that the, the Twin Cities area really rallied behind um, what they felt was an, an unjust death at the hands of law enforcement, which unfortunately in this country is very much associated to race and racism for an overwhelming uh, majority of the black community in particular, but also just this country's history. What I hope to facilitate here is again, that, that connection that you, um, Ali and, and that you had with Blake, and then what has come from that? Because I think that's where the women's hockey community and, and honestly, our, our society as a whole could really uh, learn some things. So first I wanna just backtrack a little and um, you know, you shared Allie, Blake, you shared as well, but I'm, I'm curious, do you have any, any things that you hope will come out of this conversation? I know I, I've said my piece as the facilitator, but I'd really love for you both to share what you hope will come from this conversation. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, it, it's, it's something I've, I've struggled with over the last several days in, in thinking about, and um, I think if my story and, and how, you know, something that I reacted to, again, with, with no intent of mouse was able to be taken in a way that I didn't understand, I think that's a really important part. And, you know, as somebody that always tries to do the right thing and, you know, to be put into that spotlight as what is, you know, whatever, it was, it was really eye-opening. And I think that there are a lot of other people that have similar shoes to me where, you know, we, 
we are inclusive and we love everybody. We love, you know, our black community, everyone, and, you know, have always tried to be supportive and want to have open doors and all of that. But I think that there are a lot of things that we don't understand. And, you know, similar to how I didn't understand the connection, um, I think that, you know, in talking to some other people over the, the past several days, there were a lot of people that originally were like, well, I don't get it either. And I was able to explain to them, I was like, well, you have to think of it. And this is what I've been, you know, educated on and how people have told me. And it really has been an eye-opening conversation. And it, it's so unfortunate that something as tragic as George Floyd's death and everyone, you know, Eric Garner and Breonna Taylor and everyone before them that has had to endure this kind of violence um, for us to understand what it's like on a daily basis, I think is a really important conversation. Simply, you know, I think that one of the quotes is just not being racist isn't enough. You're, you're essentially, you know, silence is being complicit. And I think that was a really tough message to hear, but a really important one is that it, it doesn't matter if you are inclusive and that you love and respect people and, you know, you don't judge based on skin color or any of that, because that's only half of it there's there's still a whole lot more there and to ignore the bigger picture um is is kind of the message i think yeah and i want to also have you chime in blake um what are your hopes for this conversation um my hopes for this conversation i mean i've had days to process and you know in talking to Ellie, I felt I'm, I feel for people when they're going through pain, like I physically feel for people. And so I want you, Ellie, to feel like you have released that bad stuff out of you and to move on because you are doing the right things and you are making amazing strides. And this is not like a bash Ellie, bash white people conversation. Yeah. It's a, let's just have a conversation to understand where anger, where frustration comes from. You know, I am a black woman that has played a predominantly white sport my entire life. And I've never felt comfortable having these conversations until this moment. And so sometimes these things happen. You know, we have martyrs in our black history and our community and you know, I'm in a privileged position, you know, I have privilege within my own sector of race, too. So I just want there just to be an understanding. And, and I believe that we are and can be stronger together um, and can be compassionate individuals and be anti-racism. Because like you said, just just being cool and saying, yeah, I got black friends, so I'm not racist. Like, you know, my boyfriend's white. He's not racist, but he knows, you know, we have these conversations. We can go into a store and people can look at us weird. Like we go through these things. I go through these things and, you know, talking about it helps. And it's at every single person's doorstep right now. Wow. Yeah. I really appreciate you um, saying that, Blake, because obviously both of you are athletes, you're on the ice, um, you know, both Boston College alumna and have really been able to carve a space out in, in the hockey world. Um, and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. As someone who is new to the hockey space, but also identifies as Black, I must say that I, I hear where Blake is coming from. And these are conversations that I also have just recently started asking people about like Blake. I, I always ask Blake about this stuff, but uh, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but um, I mean, you know, that's just because you, you talked about martyrs, but you've always been billed rightfully so as a pioneer. And so there's a lot of expectation that comes with that. And we've talked about that over the years. But in the last few months, I've also made a point to talk to other athletes. So um, like a Jillian Dempsey or, um, you know, to, to talk to players and, and also executives about what this means outside of the, the heavy context that we have now. And I think the place that I want to go next is um, to you, Blake, 
when you when Allie reached out to you, as I understand, you offered her not just as a friend to be there and to listen, but you also offered her some resources. And yeah. I'd love for you to to take us through um, as you were hearing what Allie was was giving you. You said you hadn't seen the tweet. Um, you know what was it? Um, that made you feel that one, she was ready to receive, and two, that these particular resources would be supportive. If you could just walk us through that. Well, she texted me when I was cooking, and you know, <laughs> I was like, I can't handle this right now. I can't talk to you later. Um, but I was thinking as I was going on through the 15, 20 minutes, because I texted you pretty quickly after. Yeah. And I was like, she's going through it. Like, I need to support her right now. I don't want to talk to her tomorrow. I need to talk to her right now. So I just took a step back and was thinking, okay, if I was in Allie's shoes, what do I think would help me understand or what, what, Simply, what would help me understand? And as a black person, I have viewed this documentary called 13th and it's on Netflix. And it, when I watched the documentary, my whole ideolo ideology about the government, about black people in America, I mean, I know my black history. I am a part of black history, but that documentary shifted everything that I thought about our judicial system, our police force. And to add, my dad is was a police officer in a black neighborhood in Cleveland, and he is white. So I had like all of these thoughts and emotions that I've been kind of going through these last couple of days, but just in this documentary per se, this is where all the anger is coming from. And I just wanted her to understand that this is systematic. This is on purpose. This is, this is years, you know, it, like years of in the making. So I just needed her to see it and she watched it. And unfortunately she couldn't sleep because she was like, holy crap, this sucks. I understand, but she got it. And she wasn't like, I don't know about that. I, I don't really believe in that. It was facts. And she felt it. And I just kept sending her more information, more things about white privilege. And, and I knew that she could handle it because Allie is a tough cookie. And I was like, she's reaching out to me for a purpose. I'm not just going to sugarcoat it. Yeah, I think that's extremely powerful. And Allie, I'm, I'm curious how much of what was documented in th the 13th, um, which is named after the 13th Amendment, of course, um, how much of that history did you know before going into watching the film? I mean, you know, the general things that I've learned in history class over the years, and I did take a class on criminal justice at BC, um, but it was never necessarily broken down to a, a, an issue of race necessarily. You know, they talked about that period of the 1970s where it was all about mass incarceration and that's really where we became the most incarcerated, you know, in the world. And it was, it was never quite as direct about what the initiatives were at that point. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and so it was, it was always, you know, every history book that I'd ever read and I will be perfectly honest, I'd history wasn't my best subject. I, I tried really hard and I, you know, I just, I was more of a math kid, but you know, it was always very more general and it was just like, you know, from the, this period of time, this happened and it didn't break it down like that. And, you know, I think what else was really powerful beyond that and, and understanding kind of even the period before that, when we gave black people rights for the first time, I mean, now looking back at in the year 2020, it, it's mind blowing that that even had to happen. It's like we we had to have a movement for black people to be able to vote. You know, it's just everything behind it. And then I think what was also really something that hit me was one of the women in the video was talking about how in movies and TV and you know everything else black people are portrayed in negative roles and negative things 
at a proportion that's much higher than reality. And so when this is what you're seeing on a daily basis, I think that's where, you know, a lot of when another video that Blake showed me was how black parents have to have conversations with their children about, you know, how to handle situations and with officers and others and, you know, the, the threat of being a black man. And there's the quote of, at what age do I go from being cute to being a threat? And then that all just was so heartbreaking because that's not a conversation that I've had to have in my family. I've, I've never had, I have two older brothers. My parents didn't need to have that conversation with them. It didn't need to happen with me. But I think then when what, like putting it all together, it's, you know, when you see those images and that's, if you're not educated enough or you, you don't know that you should ask more questions, when that's what's portrayed in front of you constantly, I can understand where that fear comes in because that's what you're seeing. And, and that was probably even more powerful was that, wow, this is really something that's so ingrained in our everyday life. And, and I get how horrible that is to, to have to have that conversation with your kids and with anybody, nobody should feel that way. And, you know, the, the fear that I felt with the riots and everything going on in Minnesota was horrific. It was horrific. And I've never experienced a, a trauma like that. And, you know, we talk about there was the Ferguson riots and there were other riots over time, but it was never in Minnesota. It was never in my city. It wasn't the people that I love being affected. It wasn't, you know, my dad grew up in Minneapolis. My mom grew up in St. Paul. Like this is everything I've ever known. And so that it all just kind of comes together. And that fear that I felt in those four days, um, this is something that people of color and black people specifically feel every single day of their life. And that was really a, a breaking point for me. Yeah, and well, I think, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> that was just really powerful, Allie. And, and I think, Allie, what you're getting at and, and language that people um, who study these types of, um, you know, instances of, of systemic racism, like a Michelle Alexander, like a Brian Stevenson, uh, to your point that that's exactly what they do. They spend time in history um, drawing the through line between you know, slavery in the United States and mass incarceration today. And those are things that when we have these moments, unfortunately, of bodies laying in streets or people being shot in their own home, there is not always time to get into that very long, very saturated history of racism um, in the United States. And so, I think a lot of people are grappling with seeing buildings burning and looting and all of that stuff and connecting that to the, the, the root issues that are happening right now. And I think that that is a very natural struggle. I think it, it's, it's okay to, to struggle with that, but it's also important to understand where that comes from. And I think that on social media now, whether or not, I'll put it on me, I personally agree with how people, as they say, came at you, that's almost not the point. The point is that, you know, there, there was equal pain uh, there, maybe not equal, but there was, there was um, pain on both sides of, of your words, even if that was not the intent. And so what I think those, these are difficult conversations, right? They're difficult to have at any point in time. But I want to transition into now thinking of hockey. Like, let's come up with a really good foundation. And as I, again, as I said before, I've never had this conversation because I was always, I felt honestly muffled. Like, I didn't want to rock the boat too much. I was getting a lot of attention just for the color of my skin. And some people are saying, oh, well, why is she getting a, you know, attention just because of the color of her skin? Like, we don't see color. Why is that a big deal? But mm, it is a big deal. Actually, it is a big deal because I didn't have someone that looked like me because I went through some ish growing up playing in this sport, <laughs> you know? 
I don't think that you guys had to do that. Well, I'm pretty sure that you did it. So let's just all understand so we can cut the crap and not let this happen, or at least be aware of it. So if it does, we understand what to do and how to handle it and what to talk about and how to support each other.